So welcome and thanks everyone for coming to the first in a series of a week in the life of style meet the hub type sessions. Um, this is the first one. These are going to be a really great way to learn how other hubs function, what they find most effective and perhaps what some improvements that you can make to your own way of doing things. Um, joining us today for the first one is Sarah Rock from Tamar Grow Local. Um, so Sarah is actually one of the founders of Open Food Network UK and helped bring the OFN to the UK over five years ago. And Tamar Grow Local is a community interest company and umbrella organisation um, for Tamar Valley Food Hubs. So, yeah, I'm going to pass over to Sarah now, who's going to tell us um, more and share what a week in life looks like for Team Tamar Valley Food Hubs. There we go. Thanks, Kay. <laughs> I'll say that again <laughs> um, for that lovely intro. Um, before we get going with some slides, just um, a few background bits about Tamar Valley Food Hubs and Tamar Grow Local. Um, so I joined the organisation when we started the Food Hub back in 2013 and we've been steadily growing since then, um, which is uh, the way that we like to do things is steady incremental growth. And then um, COVID happened in March and things went a bit crazy. Um, we work with 60 plus producers and we've got about 1500 plus product lines and those vary um, throughout the season. We operate nine collection points and we do both home and um, workplace deliveries as well. We deliver about 2000 items of shopping a week and we're currently averaging <laughs> 150 and 160 orders a week. Um, okay, so this is where I try to do something like share my screen, um, which is, here we go, desktop share, and then we go into this weird, there we go. Can everybody see that? Yep, looks great. Fabulous. Okay, so um, yeah, a week in the life of Tamar Valley Food Hubs. What does it look like? So um, Mondays are all about tidying up and regrouping, dealing with answer phone messages, any fallout from Friday. So this Monday we had two customers who couldn't find their shopping um, because one had where it had been delivered um, and put under the bench in the porch rather than in the porch just so that the rain didn't come onto the shopping. So um, yeah, so we deal with all those answer phone messages and start clearing up from Friday. Um, which involves a lot of sanitizing of cool bags, um, which we don't, we started using compostable um, carrier bags inside our cool bags. So everybody's shopping goes in them. So we don't actually end up throwing so many away nowadays because they stink of fish, for example. Um, and then uh, after we've sort of like had a, a power tidy, um, we have our team meeting and we share the figures for last week, um, lessons that we've learnt, any issues that arose from Friday, um, so any customer complaints or comments or anything that happened. Um, we sort of chat about um, whether or not there's any improvements that we could make to our processes or how we could prevent mistakes and any known issues for the coming week if, so, if there's somebody away or oh, there's a producer on holiday or something like that. Um, so on the little picture here, these are a few little devices that we use to help prevent those mistakes that have come out of these team meetings. So I got to hear flag. Um, so somebody's picking out some doing some picking out and they get distracted and they have to go and do something else and then so they they clip that i got to hear flag so 
that we don't have sort of like, where did you get to, Rach? And all that sort of thing going on that helps us, you know, oh, I can't remember. So these little aids and flags and, and signs to all on bright yellow paper to help us identify where we are in our processes. Um, we also have our whole foods delivered on a Monday. So we check that delivery, we update our stock. And also we call our customers who don't use the internet or they call us to put their orders onto the system. That's something that started during lockdown where we had lots of phone calls from people very scared who couldn't sort of like, they didn't use the internet, they couldn't get a delivery, they didn't know what to do, they were scared and they felt very vulnerable. And we were taking um, orders from them over the telephone and putting them through the system for them. Um, we don't do so many of those now. In fact, one of our older customers, she's actually learned how to put, do her own order on the system. Um, and so, but we still have that process in place just in case. Um, we also call our wholesale customers, people who have our apple juice and honey to see if they need a top up of any of those items. Um, we check and amend our subscription orders. We have um, some holiday home hampers that we do. So we change the numbers depending on um, how many um, they've got occupied that week and how many hampers they want. Um, we also process our refunds and our refer a friend cashbacks. So this is something that we've been doing recently. We put little stickers on all the boxes that go out and everybody who refers a friend when they check out, if they say who their friend was in their comments box, then both them and their friend get a five pound cashback, um, which has helped to really help to sort of like extend our reach. Um, we've got one particular customer in Plymouth who um, she's become her own mini hub almost. So she has like four or five of her friends and neighbors come and collect from her so that they share the delivery cost. And um, yeah, they all sort of like see each other, get to say hi. So it's sort of like building a community around there. Um, we also, any new customers that we've had the previous week, we send them a welcome email. So that will say, please sign up to our newsletter. Um, here you can give us some feedback. Here's some more information about the food, how the Food Hub works. Um, and yeah, what else does it say? Mm. Yeah, just a welcome. And then on the first Monday after the last Friday, we run the order cycle supplier totals report for the month so that we can check the previous month's payments um, for our producers so that we can get them paid. So that's a Monday. Tuesday's our big day. So this is when our order cycle closes at 9.30. Um, we always do an early morning Facebook reminder post. Um, so that goes out about 8, 8 8.15, 8.30, so that, you know, it gives people an hour to sort of like get their orders in. And the first thing that we do is we run the delivery report to check um, customer delivery information. We sort it by shipping method, um, and then we check all the addresses are within our delivery area. We've had quite a few people place an order and either, um, yeah, they just live that too, bit too far out for us to deliver to them. And then we contact them, apologize and, and cancel their order and refund. On that delivery report as well, you've also got all the um, customer instructions. So all the notes that people leave. Um, so things like no onions in our veg bag, please. Can I have my socks back that I left in my box that you took away when you collected your packaging last week? Um, or um, yeah, other, other little messages that we get sort of like delivery not before a certain time or and we make notes of those. But if there's any issues that we need to resolve before placing orders with our producers, then we'll contact our customers first, update their order, and rerun the report. 
And when we've got it all, when we think we've got everything right, um, we will copy and paste the delivery report into our packing sheet that um, will um, come up with our, that, that's where, how we do our pick lists. We've also got a delivery report um, Excel spreadsheet with lots of different tabs on it, which is how we arrange deliveries. And I'll talk a bit about that in a bit. Um, then what we'll do is we'll run our pack by supplier, re supplier reports and check for any order anomalies. And this will be things like um, somebody's ordered 23 boxes of biscuits and it's like, we had one one week where somebody ordered 10 loaves of bread and we thought, oh, she must be having a party. She didn't, she, ordered, she meant to order one, not 10. So we check those now with our customers to make sure that um, they've, they've got the right numbers. Um, and then um, for one of our bread producers, we, with the pack by supplier report, we will um, order that um, alphabetically in customer order and um, then all the scones and buns etc because otherwise if we said oh one customer wanted 10 rolls the producer wouldn't necessarily know that so we send a second email to that producer saying oh these um, 10 rolls are for this customer those 10 rolls are for another customer we do that for rolls and scones and buns and sort of small items that can be packaged together so we reduce the packaging on that one um, the other way that we use the pack by supplier report on a tuesday is we do um, refillable milk bottles so um, we buy in milk in bulk and um, customers give us give us their bottles back sort of like and then uh, one week and so they have if they have two bottles a week then they'll buy four bottles and we'll have two and they'll have two any particular week and so that we've got a packing list for um, our milk our refillable milk then we will print what we call the master list and this is the source of all truth for what our producers need to deliver so that's the order cycle suppliers totals report and um, then we'll just quickly check that report go to the order cycle click on notify producers and all the emails go out to our producers. Then we'll do that again for our wholesale order cycle. We'll check um, that the emails have been, um, have all gone against the master list. We will then text orders to some producers who don't, who don't use email. We'll phone through orders to producers who don't use email or text messages. Um, and then, yeah, we'll sort of just make sure that we've got all the, uh, everything ordered is the first thing to do so that the earlier our producers know what they need to deliver, the better. Then, um, we'll run the customer pack by customer report, copy and paste that into the, um, packing, the Google packing sheet that, um, OFN have very kindly devised for us and then we'll run a few macros and print off our pick lists all ready for Wednesday. We'll um, <clears throat> set up the next order cycle, update stock levels um, for certain producers, take certain producers out who are going on holiday, um, we have one producer where um, they are either, we only have them on our order cycle every fortnight. Um, we add in our subscriptions, which are different. Some of them are weekly, some of them are fortnightly. Um, and we update the date in the delivery details on the outgoing page of the order cycle. So, uh, then we um, deal with our invoices and um, so we'll filter our invoices by order cycle and print them out by, by each shipping method, um, single-sided. 
Um, we're actually playing with some changes in these processes at the moment so that um, we don't, some of them we don't print off until Friday. Um, and that the reason for that is because a lot of them need editing between Tuesday and Friday. So we're trying to prevent those edits, which are all handwritten at the moment. Handwritten note on an invoice is a really lovely thing anyway. Um, we, we write little notes up to our customers on their invoices all the time. But um, if we don't have to adjust meat weights and all that sort of thing until playing around with those processes at the moment. Um, so the big job that we have on a Tuesday is to plan our deliveries. So the delivery report, um, actually matching our deliveries, because not all customers order every week. So matching those deliveries with available vans and the size of those vans and the availability of the drivers um, is, is an art in itself. So, um, we also need to let some of our collection points to also our producers. So um, Pepper Street Dread Breads, um, his wife runs the post office in Beer Alston. So he takes back orders for people to collect at the post office. We have village hall um, collections as well. So we let them know how many people to expect. And once we've worked out all the different delivery rounds, we need to contact all the drivers, make sure they're available and tell them what time they need to be here. Then once we've got this huge pile of paper, we alphabetize everything. So all the pick lists are in alphabetical order, all the invoices are in alphabetical order by delivery route. Um, and that means that we can find things really easily. So looking for orders or trying to find things is always the most time consuming thing. Um, so that makes that as efficient as it can be, or we think it does. Um, so yeah, I think that's enough for Tuesday. Tuesday's a long, long day. <laughs> so, here we go, um, Wednesday. So Wednesdays are mainly about pre-checks. So we have to make sure everything's ready. We have to make sure we're complying with safer food, better business. Everything's clean. All our opening and closing checks are done. All our temperature checks are done with our fridges and our freezers. Then we take a pile of pick lists from each delivery run and pick out all the items we've got in stock. So all our food, um, our whole foods. And then everything's all organized within delivery order, um, delivery round order on, in alphabetical order in the shelves. Um, we label our apple juice and honey and um, making sure there's enough for the Friday deliveries. We'll schedule our social media posts, and we'll try to come to Kay's lovely webinars. Okay, then on Thursdays, um, we pack up our seasonal veg and fruit bags and our producers start to deliver as well. So that's a really useful time um, when we can meet our producers and we can talk to them about what's new, what's in stock, remind them to update their stock levels, um, and just sort of like have a chat with them because they're central to everything that we do. And then you'll see our lovely timetable on the um, left of the, the screen there, where everything is timed to absolute perfection. Fridays. Okay, so we start at 7.30. Our producers carry on delivering until 10. We start at 7.30 because some of our producers actually deliver overnight. So we check everything against our master list, make sure that we've got everything. Um, and we start going through the invoices, 
noting any items that aren't delivered, writing apologies and little notes to customers, answering comments or queries that they've put in there. And then we'll adjust any prices for changes in meat weights, note the credit or balance for the customer, so that they need, know what they need to pay or the refund to expect. And then picking continues for all our produce delivered until about 11 o'clock when we need to start picking out chilled items for Peppered Street Breads. This is the um, bread, the, the baker, whose wife owns the post office, who's also a collection point. So he arrives about 11.30 and then he takes back any orders for collection at the post office. And um, because the bread is the last thing to arrive on the pick list, we highlight those in yellow so that we know that those orders are, need to be um, actually picked out first for the bread. So one person then starts picking out the bread in delivery round order. And at that point as well, we also try to identify where any um, homeless shopping and homeless in inverted commas, these are things that haven't been picked out and they're in a table in the middle. And it's like, where do these items actually belong? Then somebody starts picking out the chilled items which are checked and bagged up for dispatch. So those items are then bagged up into a compostable bag and put into a cool bag. Um, then um, a, a third person then reunites the cool bag with the customer's box ready for dispatch. And all chill picking, reuniting and dispatching is done in reverse order of delivery. So the last delivery is ready to be put into the first. So when the pick list is taken away for picking out the chills, the input identified as that customer's box. And then so when list, and when the order is ready to dispatch, we um, sellotape the um, pick list to the side of the box. And that is the code to say, ready to leave the building. <laughs> so the van driver then, um, along with the person who is doing the reuniting and dispatching, they perform van Tetris and oh, you have to be a certain age to know what that means. But it's this sort of like getting everything in the van without it falling over. Um, and the pick lists are on the outside of the box so the van driver can see um, the box, who, which box belongs, belongs to who quite easily. Then we make sure the driver's got their list and they know where they're going. Um, the van drivers all also have um, a little kit in their van. Uh, we need to make sure that they're fully briefed with all COVID protocols. Um, they know what to do in an emergency. So we've got a, a long um, checklist of things that we go through with um, drivers um, and yeah, so that they know that they need to sanitize in between um, different drivers being in the vans as well. So we keep in touch with our drivers throughout the day through WhatsApp and messenger groups, make sure they're safe, make sure that um, any queries that they've got, any addresses they can't find, um, you know, they, they can just keep in touch with us throughout the afternoon. <clears throat> And then after the last round has gone out, we do what we call fridge check to see if there's anything left over and what um, we might be disappoint how we might be disappointing our customers that week. We are in a um, constantly trying to uh, customers with the shop. Thing at all times is our reason for being. <laughs> um, Shopfront opens again about six o'clock. New, um, what's in the veg bag that um, might be of interest to our customers? Go home about six o'clock um, and then um, just keep an eye out for 
emails and messages for, from drivers or customers. So the weekend, um, just keeping an eye out for emails and messages. We send out, um, we do a Facebook post, post on a Sunday evening to coincide with sort of like antiques roadshow sort of time, good time to do your shopping. Uh, but mostly we like to eat <laughs> all the lovely food. And this is, um, this little row of pictures is everything that's available on our food hub this week. Um, yeah. Great. And is that a run? Is that too long? Is that enough? That's about right. Awesome. Thank Yay. you so much. That was such wonderful, detailed, just totally. Yeah, awesome. Thank you so much for giving such a detailed run through of what a week looks like in the life of the Tamar Valley Food Hubs team. It's really, really interesting and it just packs so much into a week. And there's a, a note from Louise in the chat and it was just, what time do you go home on a Tuesday? <laughs> Packing so much into the day. So thank you so much for that. Um, and my internet's being a bit iffy, so I'm going to pass over to Louise to facilitate um, an awesome Q and A. We've got lots already in the chat, um, so I'm yeah, so I'm sure Louise is going to come from there. So thank you so much, Sarah. That was really valuable and interesting. So that's okay. Shall I deal with the chat questions first? Um, yeah. yeah, Sarah. I was just going to say, like, um, if we just go start from the top with the chat. I think Sarah had a few questions, and then just to cover them in order if that's all right um just so that we get everybody in and be fair so sarah do you want to ask you a couple of questions first um i'm not sure i can remember them first one is how much do you charge for deliveries um yeah, so some of our deliveries are free um so some that are very very close um or on our way home in our local village um, or where we also have the local carpenter also delivers in our local where we live in what the village that we live in so they're free um, we have them as as we expand out it's one pound fifty for um, our nearby parish then it's two pound fifty for the wider Tamar Valley and then £3.50 for Plymouth and Saltash, which is our furthest. Um, so it's sort of like as it spreads out. Um, yeah. How many people work on, on the team? Did, I mean, you might have said and I didn't hear it. No, um, so it, there are five of us who are... Um, permanent employees. Uh, four of us work part-time um, and then on Fridays we have an additional four subcontracted delivery drivers. And that, that was my final question. Where do you find your delivery drivers? Are, they're not volunteers, I presume. They're foot, they're properly paid up. Well, one of our um, yeah, one of our delivery drivers is a volunteer that's been with us since um, lockdown, and he does it because he really enjoys it. He's our local chippy. Um, he gets quite a lot of business actually out of it from driving around in his his sign written van doing deliveries. Um, so he does it, I've offered to pay him, he won't take any money from us. <laughs> um, one of our drivers is one of our director's brothers who um, has been pushed into doing it because um, he's having free bed and board with his brother at the moment. Um, and uh, we also have quite a few friends in the creative arts and um, who have no work at the moment and so um, we have been um, giving them work basically um, because they are not going to be doing the sound engineering for 
uh, Phil Collins or running the uh, Strictly tour or um, putting up marquees at Glastonbury. So these are people who we know and um, are customers, friends, we've worked with before and so we've been um, giving them some employment. And you pay them for it? Yes, we do, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Sarah, that's really interesting. It's really interesting to see how everyone gets involved and the connections between you all. Um, I think Rachel's got a couple of questions that she posted in the chat. Rachel, do you want to ask your questions? Thank you. Um, so you mentioned that some of your producers don't um, have text or email. Um, how do you deal with the monthly payments? Are you waiting for an invoice from, from them or um, how does it work? And are all of them paid monthly? Yeah, everybody's paid monthly, um, direct um, into their bank accounts. Um, and because we deal with producers from people who are just selling a bit of surplus out of their garden, um, or they have, um, you know, half an acre, or it's not really a big business for them, um, I do that directly from the reports. Other, uh, some of our other growers, we get invoices from because you know they're they're fairly big, medium to big, you know, large growers. Um, so it's quite a combination. But you'd recommend monthly and doing and sticking to that time frame for everybody. Yeah, I mean, otherwise, you know, it's a lot of admin. It takes me a long time to make all the payments, even once a month. So you extend that to weekly, and yeah, it's so just being and every. I mean, yeah, they, everybody is really happy with it because they get. I mean, sometimes they get paid before the end of the month, depending on when the last Friday is. So they do get um, they do get paid really quickly compared with a lot of other people that they deal with. Okay. That's helpful, thank you. And then one other question I had was, um, when the product arrives at the hub for the first time, the producers arrive or whoever it is that drops it off, do you do some sort of checks at that point? Can you? Yeah, yeah, so we count everything in um, against the master list um, to make sure that they've actually delivered what's been ordered. Um, and then we know if there's something short, then um, we, can sort of like adjust somebody's invoice accordingly. Okay, okay. So it's, it's just quantity and um, also temperature or not even? Um, well, uh, most of are frozen and um, boxes. Um, yeah, and we temperature check as we put it into our fridges and freezers, yeah with an infrared at the moment. Um, yeah. 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 Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Susie or Sue, you had a, a question. I think you might. Yes. Just, just um, what's your legal structure as an organization? Yeah, we're a community interest company. Uh, okay. Yeah. I thought that might be the case. Thank you. And, and uh, do you wipe your face? <laughs> do, you, um, do you make any profit? Um, it varies. I mean, sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. Um, it, yeah, it just varies depending yeah. upon. Um, we're, we're, we basically aim for not making any money. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I understand that. Lovely, thank you. Um, I think we've got one more question from Lucy. Um, Lucy, do you want to ask Sarah? Okay, um, I just wondered, given the range of producers, you talked about having producers that were, you know, established businesses and others that are kind of more people with a bit of a bit of spare produce. How do you set the prices? You know, or do you, I mean, do you, you know, if you're selling, they're all selling lettuces, how do you decide how much is a lettuce? 
Yeah, so um, we have um, a pricing policy. Um, so because we are, you know, a community, producers, um, we tell them to, that they set their own prices basically. But we advise them to check against other producers and what they're selling and, and so that they're not undercutting anybody. Um, so there, there isn't any sort of like direct competition. And if they're say, selling the same, prod, same sort of product, then can they have a point of difference? So if they're selling um, salad, is there you know a different size or a weight or is there something different about their salad which means that they can charge a premium for it or that it's a little not quite as expensive um so yeah and we do i mean we've had rhubarb wars so you know people selling three sticks of rhubarb for a pound and somebody wanting 350 a kilo and you know all this sort of thing um so we have had to resolve those sorts of issues occasionally um but also because we have some organic produce and some non-organic produce and some like butternut squash at the moment we've had some baby ones and we've had some humongous ones so there are obvious differences there um so we don't set prices our producers do thank you the sound of the rhubarb wars at Sarah, that just made me laugh. Um, did that answer your question, Lucy? Yeah, thank you, that's really helpful. Yeah. Okay, Alison, would you like to ask some questions? You might need to unmute yourself. <laughs> Slightly <laughs> busy. <laughs> Are you, uh, would you like me to ask your questions yes, for you? Thank okay. you. Let me take this one. <laughs> Okay, um, Alison asked, how many um, on average weekly customers do you have, first of all? Um, yes, yeah, so at the moment um, it's about 150 a week. And also, um, she said, I imagine your customers are fairly affluent. Do you have any approaches for feeding those in or at risk of food poverty? And I know you do, so I'll let you yeah. uh, talk about that. Um, yeah, it's probably an important part of our work that I didn't mention. <laughs> um, so we have customers who um, come from all backgrounds, actually. Um, so it's not just fairly affluent ones. Um, and so we do have people that will order, I don't know, £200 worth of shopping a week. Um, feeding, you know, they're feeding their elderly parents who are shielding as well as their own family and their sister's family and that sort of thing. Um, and that's great, but we also have other people who like to spend some of their money on really good food. Um, so, you know, they want high welfare or they want organic and they want local food. Um, so they are quite willing to spend not 200 pounds a week but you know 10 or 15 pounds on really good quality food um and we also have um a donated bag of veg on our food hub and through this um mechanism we um fund vegetables to go to families in food poverty in plymouth and we also, every week, we um, take about 20 pounds worth of vegetables to our local soup runs um, and Salvation Army um, in Plymouth. So that's one way that we can um, help support people who, you know, can't get a decent meal. Um, and because alongside, some of the, the food hubs, some of the other work we do, we um, are involved in a project called Grow Share Cook, which at the moment is about delivering vegetables to uh, people in, um, with early onset or recently diagnosed type two diabetes, um, along with cooking support, which will, um, which with the aim of trying to help turn their life around. Um, and we have had some people reverse their type two diabetes through this project. 
this project is just about to come to an end. Um, and our next lot of funding from Plymouth City Council will be more to, about tackling food insecurity um, as a result of COVID. Um, so we do a lot of work around, around those areas as well. That's really inspirational, Sarah. <laughs> um, Rachel, you had another question you'd like to ask. Um, thank you. So when you're doing your sort, are your boxes labelled by customer name or customer number? I haven't yet run an order cycle, um, so I, it may be very clear when it happens, but I just seeing as you were there, I thought I'd ask the question. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Um, everything is customer name, everything in surname order. Okay, and it doesn't cause problems with such large numbers of customers. Uh, oh gosh, we've got three people with the surname Hill. <laughs> okay. um, they're not related, are they? <laughs> yeah. um, but generally they're in different delivery rounds. So um, everything is ordered within delivery round in customer server surname order. Okay, lovely, thank you. It made me think, Sarah, when you mentioned this earlier, that um, you do it by alph alphabetically by your um, surname. Now, I'd be right at the end all the time, so it's good if your surname starts with A to get on the top of your pick list. But I want, do you ever get any moans from customers that, 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 that near the end of your pick list, or is that just me being silly? <laughs> <laughs> well, you see, everything then gets reordered as it goes into a van in delivery order okay so yeah fair, fair point okay i've just been silly okay um so if, I, if you're the first deliver, if you're the first delivery um louise you'd be right at the top okay alistair from helston had some far more better questions alistair would you like to ask sarah Hi, sorry. I, sorry I'm a, I, I arrived about half an hour late to this meeting, so apologies if these have already been covered. Uh, so, I have two questions. One was, uh, seemed to come into one on the on the question thing, but um, do you do you sort of curate your producers at all? So, if you've got too many, got got five people wanting to sell rhubarb, do you do you just pick the ones closest or the most organic or the cheapest or whatever or do you just let the customer decide that and just have as many producers as you like of any um of any one thing uh we have had we have had said no to some people um when it's exactly the same product um but generally veg we just know as much veg as we can get really and fruit um and yeah ultimately it's customer you know the customer decides um which they want you know some some of our customers have favorite growers and they'll buy salad from one but not from another and they've been through them all you know at one point they will have bought all the salad from all the different producers and then they go oh but i really like that person's salad do you think, um, it's, because, do you think it's because you've got you've got more scale because I, I i worry with my you know sort of 25 to 30 orders a week that if i have i could have three different I've, I've been offered kale from three different people and and i could get you know i could get veg from a number of different people but then if that's divided into three then the 100 quid that michael makes at the minute is going gonna, is gonna to go down to 30 and it's just not going to be worth it while i'm doing it yeah i mean i think yeah with kale you've probably got you know more similarity than with salad for example hmm um yeah i would tend to um but then you see we've got a lot of different kales on the system at the moment and that's what we try to encourage our producers to do is to grow something different that nobody can get in a supermarket anyway so our bog standard green curly kale doesn't sell as well but our jagalo nero and siberian kale and mixed bags of kale and chard do sell really well so i think it's that yeah if you've got something that's a little bit different then mm. that's great 
but having too much of the same, exactly the same thing, yeah, doesn't do anybody any favours. Okay, thanks. And my second question, which I did ask you by email earlier on this, this room, but I don't know if you covered it at all, but I was just, I'm wondering about doing home deliveries. Uh, I just got a couple at the moment, just collection points. Um, but I was trying to work out how to how to manage, how do you manage, how does that work? And because um, I was thinking, if I, if I have set times for my collection points, if I have an increased number of home deliveries in between those two collection times, my my I have to change the collection time at these at those certain points each each week, which seems pretty unsatisfactory. I don't know if you can describe how you how you, how you manage that part of the business. Yeah, so our collection point times are quite short um, little windows, actually. They're usually only about 15 minutes. Um, and our customers are pretty well trained, actually. They turn up, they collect their shopping, they go. Um, and then, but what we tend to do, because we have so many different drivers, um we'll only give them like one collection point so they've only got one time frame that they have to hit and then they can fit their deliveries in and around that that fixed time point um for that that collection point but then we cover quite a wide area um we never actually guarantee delivery at a certain time um, so that that gives us some flexibility. So the inflexibility of the collection points is sort of like balanced a bit by the flexibility of our mm. delivery. Okay. Um, I it's it is an art trying to um, trying to get the collection points and the deliveries right and the size of the vehicle and all that sort of thing and not sending anybody you know trying to keep people in quite small areas um for their deliveries and it just always depends on who orders that week are they are they your own your own vehicles and and staff um, driving or do you hire people in for, for some of those no we've got um three vans um and they they will go out and then come back um, so each person in each van normally does two delivery rounds or two, deli two collection points, um, or they'll do a combination of collection points and de deliveries. Um, and then we've got four people who use their own vehicles. And you, are they volunteers or are you paying people to? Uh, it's a mixture. Mm -hmm. Some people are press ganged into it by their brothers. Great, thank you, Sarah. All right. Quite happy to chat more at length, Alistair, if you want to, you know, talk about it more off, you know, sometime else. Yeah, one, one time when I'm working up at KCL, I'm going to come up and see you hopefully once we can do that. Right. It's really good to see how the the network connects with the other people. It's really great. Um, Lucy, you had a question. We've got about 10 minutes left, so get as many questions as you can. I just wanted to know um, whether you vet producers at all. Um, I'm thinking particularly around meat. Do you do any, you know, do if people say that they're free range or do you have any way of checking that their produce really is locally produced? Um, yes. It I mean, with me, it's particularly important, I think. Um, we um, get all of our producers to fill in a producer form before we um, sign them, allow them to sign up. Um, and with our meat producers, um, we either go and visit them um, or we do act, because it's quite, you know, Cornwall's the, the biggest village in the world. Um, mm -hmm. We do actually know a lot of people who know a lot of other people. So you, we usually get them through a recommendation. Um, and yeah, we know, yeah, we, and we, like I say, we visit. Thank you. 
Um, did that answer your question, Lucy? Yeah, no, no, sure. I mean, it, yeah, I, I, we've had a, we've had issues of. I think because you're doing low, if you're if you're a food producer commercially, and you have for some reason you haven't got enough eggs, say your instinct is to find more eggs to meet your customer demand. But then if you're selling local produce, you don't want producers to do that. So it's, sometimes it's yeah, we've had that experience. It can be. Um, you know, it's counterintuitive for their for their normal way of doing business. Um. That's a yeah, um, I get that, and um, we we've, we've I mean, especially because most of our meat producers, especially our our farmers, so they're direct from the farms, and we know the farms, and we know the farming families. Mm -hmm. No, it sounds really good. Great. Thank you. Rachel, you had another question. Yeah, my friend, it's another basic one, but uh, hopefully a quick one then. Um, so just looking down all the products that we've we've got on our hub um, that's launching tomorrow, um, I'm, I wanted to be make sure that it was really clear, for example, packs of bread rolls, for example. So there's one baker and he makes four bread rolls in one pack. Do, have you got it listed as one pack and then in the in the description right this contains four bread rolls or do you do the item as rolls and put in the number four so it says it's four rolls oh yeah this is one of the banes of my life is consistency when producers add their own products yeah yeah <laughs> um, i just don't want everything to be multiplied by four by the time it gets to them <laughs> so what would you recommend that's true yeah, so um, I think it, in the item description, it's always useful if you've got a multi-pack of something to say that it's a pack of four. Um, and then you have items, so if it's rolls, you have, um, you call the item a roll or rolls, and then you've got four. So you've got it in two places. But then when that gets to the, when, when the, when the order, when the purchase order is sent to the producer, do they not receive, um, so if 10 people ordered four packs, sorry, if 10 people ordered one pack each and each pack had four rolls in, would they get the order for 40? 40 individual It'll rolls? It'll be an order, or would they get order, the order for 10. For packs? No, it'd say um, 10 packs of four. So then the the unit needs to be a pack, does it? Does does the unit on the system need to be a pack? Sorry, I think I lost you there, Rachel. Does does the unit of measure therefore need to be one pack? And then in the description say one pack of four rolls. It's what it's whatever makes most sense to your producer when they get their email, really. Um, let me find yeah, this is it. I'll find our list and see how they're listed actually. Now, oh, somebody's borrowed it. Um, so yes, we because we have like tins of olives in packs of three, and sometimes, yeah, that's it's whatever makes sense to your producer okay all right thank you <laughs> help, <is it? laughs> well hopefully it'll make sense to them thank you yeah. <laughs> rachel that might be something that you kind of um work out as you go along once you've had a few weeks um i'm sure it's like it it's it, it, it's just trial and error to see what works mm -hmm. for your particular group of people yeah. um do we have any other questions? I think, what are we thinking? I think um, other people are thinking of questions. I think Kay had a question. Um, Kay? I wanted to kind of jump in and say we've got five minutes left. Um, so if anyone else has any questions, if they'd like to ask their questions first, um, that would be great. So we've got five minutes. So just feel free to unmute and just throw your question into the space. How did you get your um, customers because I've just started and um, 
I'm finding it really difficult. I'm doing it on Facebook and Instagram and everybody who comes to the market, I'm at Ulster Country Market, everybody who comes to the market gets given a bit of paper with all the information on it and the link and everything. Um, and it's, they're really resistant to it. But I haven't started doing deliveries yet. That's the point. I'm really interested about the deliveries. Do you think that's essential? Yes, I mean, when we first started, um, I think all of our customers, we did know them all personally. Um, and word of mouth has actually been our best form of advertising. Um, but I think, you know, one thing that we benefit from is, have, is doing much, a lot of project work as well, as well and a lot, of, a lot of wider sort of like food work. Um, you know, some of our customers sell us apples and so we, we have quite um, an integrated system, I suppose, in, in, its, in, in, the, in, the, in the valley and in, in Plymouth. Um, I think the way that we grew was we, we started off just doing collection points and when we started doing deliveries um, that made it easier for people so they didn't have to be in we delivered to a lot of log stores or porches or you know safe places um, and that made it yeah a lot easier for people to trust us but what you're actually trying to do is persuade people to change their shopping habits and that's the biggest barrier about around getting new customers I think thank you that's really cheered me up <laughs> I think how am I going to get these oh I'm sorry to change their to change their habits just to kind of jump in yeah here, Aaron, just see if um are you in our thriving food hubs Facebook group on on Facebook, Are you talking to me? Yeah, just because we've. Oh, yeah. yeah, there's a there's a in the unit section. There's a lot of um, information about how to market to your customers, and yeah, if you need any help, kind of accessing that. And I'm on the group all the time. My name's Kaylee. Just drop me a message, and I can point you in the right direction for some things that might be a good place to start, or could help with what you're doing currently on social media, in particular. You mentioned those, so yeah. Thanks. Thanks. I I will. Have a look. Louise has pointed me in the direction of quite a lot. Um, it's just having time because you know I'm a producer. I'm sitting here making pie fillings and, and all this kind of thing. So it's just having time to get it all going, really. Mm. But I will. I'll get in touch. Great. Thanks. Looking forward to, to talking to you, Sarah. And yeah, juggling all the balls. <laughs> it's hard. So just say we've got one minute left. Um, so I think now is, uh, unless there's one extra burning questions, I think now is a really nice um, place to wrap up. We've had, yeah, thank you so much, Sarah, for all of the amazing, valuable information that you shared in this session. Um, and thank you everyone for asking so many uh, perfect questions. I feel like this has just been so much information that's been shared here. And so for every question that's like pulling out all of these great, great points and things that we can learn from. So I just want to say, Thank you um, for, for agreeing to do the first of these types of sessions and there'll be more and really appreciate it. And again, thanks for everyone for your questions. And with that, I think, yeah, it's half past. So let's wrap up and hope everyone can join the Thriving Food Hubs Facebook group because if you have any other questions, generally if you pop them in there, it's a really supportive community. So it's a great place to kind of ask and get kind of group, group help. So, so yeah, thanks everyone for coming. and. Thank you. Um, we're having a bit of a break next week uh, about webinars, but we'll be back the week after and it will be a focused webinar on your Christmas operations and marketing. So more information will be given on this in the Thriving Food Hubs Facebook group. And yeah, so I hope to see everyone there and have a great rest of your week. And thanks again. Bye, everybody. Thank you very much. Bye bye. bye.